Strazuti and welcome to Russia, a truly unique country where everything seems to be on the extremes. Russia is the largest nation on earth, so large it shares borders with countries on opposite sides of the globe, like Japan and Finland. I personally lived in Moscow for several months back in 2019, so I'm feeling especially excited and compelled to share my view about this genuine country in this video, giving you my personal take on how a Western economist perceives the current state of this wonderful nation. In this video we will talk about modern Russia, starting from the origins of the Russian Federation, beginning in the early 90s, and the heritage left from the Soviet Union, following with a full depiction of Russia's modern economy, and ending with our final thoughts on the country and what the future holds for the Russian people. We will finally rate Russia with a mark from 0 to 10, it with something close to 0 would be an unsafe, unstable, poor and conflictive nation, and something close to 10, a mature, wealthy and safe economy. As always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel, so you can keep learning about economics, countries and finance. And now, let's move forward with the video. Since Lenin started the Russian Revolution in the midst of World War I and in the legacy of the Tsars and establishing the Soviet Union, the country lived under communism until 1991, when Gorbachev hammered the last nail in the coffin and the Russian Federation emerged from the ashes of the old Soviet bloc. For us Gen Z kids, whose life began in the 90s, looking back to those times makes us feel full of joy, nostalgic and grateful. I'm not so sure most Gen Z kids living under former Soviet countries share our views about back then, as the collapse of the former USSR brought these nations living under its umbrella to the edge of a civil war, or in the case of Yugoslavia, to the last bloodiest conflict in Europe's recent history. I won't get into details about why the Soviet Union collapsed, because that topic itself is too extensive to be covered only in this video, but I will explain what changed and how the shift from the old system to the new drove the process of creating the Russia we have today. In the Soviet Union, the Communist Party through its five-year plan for economic policy, which started in 1928 as part of the reforms undertaken by Joseph Stalin and known as, oh, what a surprise, Stalinism, decided what the Union needed to improve and organize their resources to achieve their goals. This management scheme proved to have serious flaws, as the supply often didn't match the demands from every specific region in the country and unrealistic goals led to high levels of corruption, falsification of data, and the deficient quality of production. Although there was some sort of private property, the state was the ultimate owner of all assets in the nation and even its people. With this scenario, when Boris Yeltsin rose to power as president of the new Russian Federation, shifting from a centrally planned economy to free markets and capitalism was done harshly and fast. The build-up of the Soviet system had been taking place for the last 60 years, and its structure was not adequately prepared to embrace a free market in a matter of months. The Soviet five-year planning had led to a massive misallocation of resources, and when the economy turned to serve the needs of market demands, many villages and cities found themselves undersupplied for basic goods and services. Today, you still find many semi-ghost towns in Russia where people remember with nostalgia the Soviet Union, which is not surprising as probably their livelihood was being subsidized by production coming from other parts of the Union that ceased to stay functioning when the plug was pulled. The transition from public ownership to privatization was wild, so wild it was literally called shock therapy reform. Everything in the country went for sale. The way and proportion the Russian pool of wealth was distributed resembled the Cantillon effect theory. In the 18th century, French economist Richard Cantillon wrote about how, through monetary policy implementation, prices can fluctuate unequally. In his view, this was due to the primary destination of money, and how those first recipients decided to spend it. Those closer to the king received the most first. Individuals closer to the king's friends received next, and the scheme went on and on and on until the peasants received the last breadcrumbs. This is what happened in Russia. By the year 2000, less than 1% of the population 
possessed almost half of the nation's resources. The new generation of oligarchs that emerged shared the luck of being well connected with a spot in the first row of the bidding race, or in some cases, they were the government officials conducting the auction of public assets. Fortunes were made overnight by commodity arbitrage between former Soviet pre-settled prices and free global markets. Commodities like oil, gas, iron ore or wheat were bought at those lower pre-settled prices to the state and immediately released into global markets at a much higher mark. Uncertainty brought by the regime change and the rush from the oligarchs and new millionaires to retain what had been won in fear of what the future government's policy would uphold, pushed them to move their fortunes overseas, mainly to the UK, with London even being called by the press Londongrad, with the amount of rich Russians and their families getting settled down in the UK's capital. The massive drain of wealth during this period led to depleting foreign currency reserves in Russian banking institutions, as all this wealth was not being invested in Russia and instead stored abroad in foreign banks. The ruble had a fixed exchange rate, which meant the central bank would use its foreign reserves to adjust the value of the currency to the target level against other global currencies, risking a dry up in reserves if the economic environment went tits up. And it happened in 1998. After the Asian currency crisis triggered speculative attacks on the ruble, Russia had to make a tough decision on how to manage its economy. When tax revenues are not enough to face debt repayments, the government has only a couple of options left to fix itself. Issuing more debt, which devalues the currency and provokes higher inflation, increased tax revenues, risking a collapse in household income and business revenues, or announce a default and force investors to take a haircut. Russia had experienced hyperinflation in the aftermath of the USSR collapse, and the event was still fresh and painful in the minds of the people in the country. As in this case, the monetary problem was coming from investors heavily betting against the ruble and the central bank being unable to defend the fixed exchange rate, the Bank of Russia decided to free flow the ruble, but the Russian government preferred to declare default in order to avoid a new hyperinflationary spiral and lose complete faith in the future of the currency. It was quite unprecedented and unusual to witness a country declaring itself in default, while the consequences definitely are nothing close to what a private corporation may experience when entered into bankruptcy procedures. But the main goal of saving the credibility of the ruble and bringing inflation and speculation under control was reached. Dramatically low oil prices also played a key role in decreasing the inflow of dollars into the nation and weakening the ruble, as Russia has been historically very dependent on oil and gas exports. The sensitivity to oil prices has been so high, it is believed the only reason the USSR stayed afloat for so long was thanks to the drastic increase in prices during the 70s and the 80s, which helped increase imports of heavy machinery, finance their crackdown on the Afghans, and continue to subsidize its communist peers during the Cold War. So when oil prices touched $11 per barrel, less than half of its value a year ago in 1997, the shock to the economy was severe. This crisis arriving after years in which Russia was slowly improving and even managed to see real GDP growth in 1997, weakened the image of Boris Yeltsin and its government while the spotlight moved towards a new uprising figure who knew how to play the role of a strong leader and felt well prepared to rebuild the country and bring back stability and order. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin became president in 1999, starting his career as a KGB agent deployed in Germany and later working closely with the mayor of St. Petersburg. Putin was a politician with the adequate background to understand what was the scheme governing Russia, and the skills to undertake a solid management and turnaround of the country. After more than two decades, Putin is still at the top, with only one brief period having his close friend Medvedev as president. Many things have changed during the last 22 years, which have shaped Russia into what it is today. So what is it like? 
How is the economy of Russia doing today? Starting with the cons, Russia is still a country with record inequality, and although the situation has shown good improvements over the last two decades, the resources of the country still are massively unequally distributed. Credit Suisse, in its famous Global Wealth Report, calculated that Russia is the country with the worst wealth distribution and where the top 1% controls the biggest portion of the country's wealth. In the case of Russia, the top 1% controls 75% of the country's resources. Bureaucracy is still not as reliable and efficient as other economies in similar size, and corruption still presents a disincentive for many foreign and national investors from landing their businesses and deploying their capital in the country. The ruble still is a weak currency, very reliant on oil prices and sensitive to fluctuations in the US dollar. As a final con, we could argue the condition of democracy is questionable, as Putin faces almost no opposition, and those who do oppose him politically may suffer some sort of physical damage coming from accidents or casual imprisonments. But hey, hold on, Russia has lots of great stuff to talk about. Continuing with the Putin line and leaving aside the debate if he may be some sort of dictator or he's not, the reality is the situation of the country with him is considerably better today than in the 90s when he rose to power. Corruption levels, although still an issue, are dramatically better. The economy has managed to become more and more resilient and since the 2014 Crimea conflict, it's shifting towards decreasing its dependency on foreign capital. It's so resilient, Russia was one of the least affected economies during the 2020 COVID shock. A historical event still ongoing today is its reliance on oil and gas exports. With the massive rebound in prices, Russia managed to navigate better than most countries the recovery from the shock. But what's even better is how thanks to extreme pro-renewable energy policies in Western economies, capex or capital expenditure from private corporations belonging to the oil and gas industry have tanked and not recovered so far. Which means Russia's market share and pricing power has increased and countries like Germany are now even more reliant on Russia's natural gas to bring prices and inflation under control. Russia continues to house the world's largest stock of commodities. From wood in Siberia to oil in Kamchatka and the Arctic Sea, gold, uranium, diamonds, all sorts of rare metals. You can literally find Russia as one of the main exporters in almost every list of commodities. Thanks in part to the increased investments to extract these resources, the Russian banking system today is much stronger than two decades ago. Inflation is being fought with appropriate monetary policy, and the country's debt is extremely low, which leaves the nightmare of defaults and ruble declines way in the past. The situation allows the government to settle taxes at a lower bound, with income tax at 14% and corporate taxes at 15% one of the lowest rates in major economies. It's not so surprising then to see the Russian economy so resilient during the pandemic, contrary to European nations with much higher tax burdens on their people and businesses. It's remarkable to mention Russia is also the second largest exporter of military equipment and houses the biggest arsenal of nuclear warheads in the world. The Russian army today is much more modern better organized and equipped than during the Afghan and Chechnya wars in the 80s and 90s. Russian soldiers are so well prepared that the country has also become one of the main spots for hiring private militaries. And with that being said, we reached the last chapter for our video, giving our final thoughts and rating Russia now that we have an overall picture of the country. I think it's fair to value Russia with a 6 over 10, although I believe this election is very questionable. One of the main problems of Russia is still inequality and wealth concentration, found mainly in the cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg, while the rest of the country is not progressing at the same speed and people still live with difficulties to access basic needs or in a state of poverty. But at the same time, there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic about Russia. Love Putin or hate him, he brought stability to the country and is a respected and feared world leader who managed to pull Russia from a state of bankruptcy and division and convert it into a much safer country 
and one of the most resilient economies during the worst pandemic in 100 years, overtaking top nations in performance and preventing a massive collapse at the time liberty and freedom was not highly limited. Russia's future growth is in safe hands given its massive stockpile of natural resources. And most importantly, the handover in energy pricing power from the West, as Europe and the US refuse to return the extraction of oil to pre-pandemic levels, and instead have aimed at overinvesting in expensive renewable energies, even though their economies are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels and will continue to be for the next decades. And you guys, what do you think about Russia? I'll be glad to hear your comments and views about the country and what you think the future holds for the biggest Slavic nation in the East. I hope you liked the video and see you soon here in Learn Economics.